in Skyward Sword, the 2011 entry in Nintendo's Legend of Zelda saga, the primary antagonist is a mysterious being known as Girahim. As Girahim repeatedly shows up and taunts our wholesome, heroic protagonist Link, it becomes increasingly clear that he isn't like most other Zelda villains. You see, Girahim stands out from the Ganons and Ganondorfs of the world by just being so, well, fabulous. Yes, the stylish, flamboyant Girahim with his robust skincare regimen to maintain those supple arms and whatever sorts of exercises he does to make his tongue capable of this is what we call a queer-coded villain. See, queer coding occurs when a character is never explicitly shown or stated to be queer, but they nonetheless behave in ways that play off of and reinforce stereotypes about queer people. So the audience is supposed to get that they're gay without it ever being stated outright. Now, queer coding doesn't inherently have to be negative. Coding can be neutral or even positive, depending on the circumstances. But the history of queer coding has largely been one of vilification and demonization. And the longest, richest tradition of queer coding can be found in cinema. See, throughout the 30s and 40s, Hollywood movies were governed by the Motion Picture Production Code, also known as the Hayes Code, which put moral restrictions on topics that movies could or could not mention. One of the verboten topics during this time was homosexuality. But while movies couldn't explicitly say that certain characters were gay, they could still code them as queer. A classic example is Peter Lorre in the 1941 film The Maltese Falcon. His character of Joel Cairo is explicitly described as queer in Dashiell Hammett's novel, but in the film, it's only hinted at through things like effeminate behavior and a mild obsession with his own appearance. I'm prepared to promise that, uh, what is the phrase, uh, no questions will be asked. By the 1980s, the Hayes Code was long gone, allowing films to be more explicit in their vilification and demonization of LGBT people, like Michael Caine's transvestite killer in Brian De Palma's 1980 thriller, Dress to Kill. <laughs> However, queer coding of villains in cinema remained fairly common practice, most notably in animated films aimed at younger audiences, like Disney's The Little Mermaid and The Lion King. Now, I want to move on to games, but to be clear, what I've just provided is merely the tiniest sample of Hollywood's long history of queer coding villains. Trust me, it's a whole thing. And for lots more on the topic, check out the 1995 documentary, The Celluloid Closet, and the book of the same name by Vito Russo. All right, let's talk video games. Of course, when games first started becoming widely common in people's homes with the success of the Atari 2600, they rarely had much real character development at all. I mean, there's only so much you can do when your heroic lead character looks like this. And even when graphics started getting better and characters looked more like this, with a few exceptions, actual character development in games remained pretty minimal. But once consoles and computers started getting a little more powerful still, game designers wasted no time following in Hollywood's footsteps and jumping into the long and celebrated tradition of depicting queerness as something threatening, degenerate, and vile, which, with any luck, will be vanquished by our wholesome and righteous heroes. In the 1991 Konami arcade game Crime Fighters 2, players face queer-coded enemies in leather with exaggeratedly effeminate walking animations who literally dry hump the player as an attack. But they don't stop there. These guys will dry hump anything. If there's a lamppost handy, hell, they'll hump that too. Similarly, in the 1994 Sega beat-em-up Bare Knuckle 3, the mid-boss Ash is an effeminate leather daddy wearing a Venus symbol around his neck whose running animations play off of the stereotype of the male sissy. Beating up these enemies, homophobic players could take added pleasure and satisfaction in the idea that they were clobbering a character who violated masculine norms and embodied a transgressive kind of queerness. When these games were released in the US as Vendetta and Streets of Rage 3, respectively, these enemies were removed, though Ash remains hidden in Streets of Rage 3's code as a secret playable character. If you think that these kinds of harmful representations were only happening in Japan, 
who boy, have I got a story for you. Following his retirement in the wake of the Los Angeles riots of 1992, disgraced, racist LA Police Chief Daryl Gates worked with Sierra Online on the fourth installment of their Police Quest series. The resulting game, Police Quest Open Season, told the story of one LAPD detective's investigation of a grisly series of murders, which, as it turns out, are being committed by a cross-dressing serial killer. How is a brave, upstanding member of the LAPD meant to deal with such a threat? Well, I'm about to show you, but let me first offer a warning that while these 1993 graphics are lacking in detail, the act you're about to witness is a horrifying display of violence. Action neutralizes your assailant. Oh, neutralizes? Is that what we're calling it? An LAPD detective just used a lighter and a can of hairspray to set someone on fire. The game requires you to kill the villain in this excruciating manner and then congratulates you for it. It's clear that players, in the role of a clean-cut, upstanding police officer, were meant to relish the fact that they were ridding the world of someone whose gender transgressions are an indication of their illness, part of what makes them sick and threatening and wrong. With its 2000 entry, Resident Evil Code Veronica, Capcom's long-running survival horror series also got in on the action of demonizing trans and gender non-conforming people with the character of Alfred Ashford. Alfred um, idolizes his twin sister Alexia, who's frozen in suspended animation for reasons. In her absence, Alfred assumes the persona of Alexia and attempts to kill protagonist Claire Redfield. I am Alexia Ashford. For the pride of the Ashford family, I will kill you. Like the villain of Police Quest Open Season, Alfred's cross-dressing is meant to be seen as just another manifestation of the same mental instability that makes them a psychotic killer. It's an indication that Alfred is deranged and threatening and needs to be dealt with. Control. My apologies, but I cannot let you escape now. <laughs> Alfred, cross-dressing freak! A few years later, in 2003's Resident Evil Dead Aim, the series would once again have a villain defy gender norms as a way of making them seem threatening and unsavory deserving of being destroyed. Morpheus Duvall begins the game as a narcissistic figure obsessed with his own appearance, and eventually he mutates into a female-coded being with breasts and bio-integrated high heels before finally succumbing to an Umbrella Corporation virus and mutating into a grotesque blob. Meanwhile, Konami's 2005 game Castlevania Curse of Darkness gives us a very clear instance of queer coding when the villainous, elegant, and effeminate Isaac kisses Trevor Belmont while impaling him. Enough talk. Time to die. <laughs> However, my personal pick for the most horrifying example of a queer-coded villain in a game would have to be Joe Slade in the original Dead Rising. One of many so-called psychopaths you can encounter Joe is a chilling example of how queerness can be demonized in the portrayals of villains. A butch lesbian cop, Joe captures a conventionally attractive woman and berates her for her presumed heterosexuality and her attractiveness to men before proceeding to molest the woman with her nightstick. In this dynamic, the conventionally feminine straight woman is presented as normal and Joe's queerness is presented as abnormal and dangerous. Officer, can I talk to you for a minute? Get your pile! If you try to interfere with official police business, start with you before I get to her! <laughs> this is a very important distinction. She is not just an evil woman who also happens to be queer. Her sexuality as with most of the characters we've discussed, is presented as part of what makes her monstrous and threatening. Beyond perpetuating harmful stereotypes and linking queerness to evil, these representations of queer antagonists also intrinsically assume that the protagonist and the player are not queer. 
they position queerness as something at odds with heroism. Rather than straight, gay, gender conforming, and gender non-conforming characters all fighting alongside each other for some righteous cause, these games create a moral spectrum in which queerness is inherently anti-heroic, linked directly to being deviant, destructive, or chaotic, and leaving it up to our wholesome, cisgender, gender conforming, presumed straight heroes to vanquish that chaos from the world. In contrast to the queer-coded villains, those straight cisgender heroes represent order and stability and decency. Their gender conformity and heterosexuality is part of what makes them good, just as the villain's queerness is part of what makes them bad. It's exceptionally rare at this point, but games can give us villains who are queer without making it seem like their queerness is part of what makes them villains. The warm-hearted game Undertale pulls this off with the Royal Guards, a mini-boss duo who express romantic affection for each other in a way that is sweet and endearing. Also, and this is admittedly a pretty weak example, but we really don't have a whole lot to work with here, in Batman Arkham Knight, at one point you can overhear a random enemy militia member casually mention his male partner. They just don't get it, do they? The mercenary life. Exactly. I put food on the table, blood diamonds in her jewelry box, I lawned all my money through her company, she didn't even have to ask, and she dumps me. I hear you. My other half's a human rights lawyer. He, uh, he thinks I'm on a business trip. Wow. We need more. More queer villains whose villainy and queerness aren't presented as intrinsically intertwined, and more heroes who are bisexual, gay, trans, non-binary, or otherwise not just the established straight cisgender norm. Heroes who demonstrate that queerness isn't something to be feared or vilified, and that bravery and heroism have no particular sexuality or gender identity.